I shall. I made sure the questions avoided chaos magic. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to complete them. I mean, no, yeah. no. It's um the the thing that I think people are responding to the most is the more um, autobiographical stuff. Mm -hmm. So just stories of people's journeys um, is the thing that people are most interested in. So we'll start with that. Um, tell me about how you first got started on the spiritual thing. Well, I used to think magic was complete bollocks, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was, I, was at, uh, I was in sixth form at school, and I was sitting in the library... Um, actually looking at a bound collection of modern myth and magic looking for pictures of nude witches which mm -hmm. I think is perfectly reasonable to do when you're about 16 or 17 yeah. and I came across um, an Austin Austin Spare picture and at, at the time I'd been reading a lot of young follies of youth kind of thing and I thought oh that makes that's that's kind of interesting that I somehow related it in my mind to young I don't know how I did it quite and that kind of triggered my interest and I just started reading as much as I could get hold of which actually wasn't a lot at the time I kind of went, I lived in Blackpool and I, I went into the library and started picking up loads of theosophical stuff, you know I read The, the Secret Doctrine in three volumes which is I think quite an achievement I certainly you know, wouldn't want to do that again <laughs> um, what they had mostly in the library was lots of kind of like Madame Blavatsky, Alice Bailey uh, Manny Besant. Alexandra David Neal, a lot of the old greats, you know, um, and some other stuff. And I think I didn't actually get started on anything practical until I picked up David Conway's Magic and Occult Primer. Right. And was that in the same library, or after did you? Um, I, I don't remember where I got it from, actually. I think I might have even bought it in Smith's or something. Ah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. It, uh, libraries seem to be at the base of uh, the stories of everyone I've spoken to mm. so far. They're, they're well, I've still got one of my kind of notebooks from the, from the time, and I used to sit in the library and copy stuff out. You know. um, I also got hold of a copy of Francis Barrett's Magus, um, and did some stuff out of that, I think. Interest, uh, what interests me, I guess, given um, where you've ended up, or to be more technical about it, the kind of thing um, you're doing now, is mm. that... Um, that uh, east-west uh, sort of mixture uh, is at the base of it. So mm -hmm. it's almost like start there, um, sort of go through Western occultism and end up... Um, well, it's, it's, I don't think it's quite that simple. I mean, I think what, ex what interested me about the theosophical stuff was, was I, thought, I thought, wow, if they're, if they're talking about this in, what, 1880, what are they going to be talking about now? And I joined the Theosophical Society and found out largely they were still talking about <laughs> you know, stuff that had gone on a hundred years ago and everybody seemed to be about 200 years to me in age, you know, I was the only person I'd go to meetings and I'd be the only person there under the age of like 30, you know, mm. everybody else would be like dot real codgers yeah. but um, I did go to one meeting one time and this, uh, there was this guy there who's a sociologist and he was I think doing his PhD on Theosophy or something and he told me about this place called the Sorcerer Apprentice in Leeds. And I was just in the process of moving to Huddersfield at the time to do my first degree. And uh, I kind of discovered the Sorcerer Apprentice, which at the time had a kind of like little, Chris, where I had this kind of lock up next door to the shop. And on Saturday mornings when people would congregate to, to buy a box off him, he'd open up this little lock up and you could sit in there and drink coffee and, you know, chew the fat, and that's where I met a lot of the first, you know, your actual occultists, rather than people who just read books and talk bollocks. Yeah, and that was kind of that was kind of my, my first leg into the you know the the actual occult community, rather than just reading about it from a distance. Because I think if you if you read about it from a dif distance, you get a quite different set of ideas than if you actually start talking to people. So, uh, uh, any names you'd recognise in this room? Um, I think I may have sit, sat next to Pete one time, right. but I'm possibly been too, you know, um, nervous to, to say, <laughs> oh, are you Pete Carroll? You know? um, possibly Ray Schoen as well. Uh, and I met this old guy there, uh, Richard Bartle Bertelli, who was also known as the Duke from Magus. And several years later, I kind of became friends with him. And he was, he was really good guy to meet for, for somebody from my age I was about 20 at the time I mean, he was in his 60s he'd been doing magic since 
the dawn of time, you know, mm -hmm. and he was he was just great. He kind of like he was one of those weird guys who could talk for hours and had his own kind of like magical system that made complete sense to him and to to an outsider it would have been what the fuck are you on about? You know? <laughs> but he was very kind of like down to earth and very level headed, and he he became you know quite a strong mentor to me in in many ways later on. Cool. And it was this uh, the move to Leeds where you sort of uh, met Dave Lee and, and all that as well. Well, no, that's that's some news in the future. I mean, I. I did a degree in social sciences at Huddersfield Poly uh, and I met some people interested in the occult there and started doing bits of pieces um, and I actually did a correspondence course with the Order of the Cubic Stone oh really if you come across them I'm f in books in books yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, they, they had this kind of like neophytes course which was uh, it was all kind of like your basic Kabbalistic and low level Enochian stuff um, and at the time I started I think I must have picked up maybe Ray Sherwin's one of the early copies of the book of the results and I started messing with sigils and made the mistake of mentioning this to my uh, OCS supervisor who wrote me some really acerbic letters in red handwriting with underlining and saying you know blah 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 don't mess with sigils uh, they'll blow your head off kind of thing um, and uh, I actually met somebody who was in the cube, who'd been in the cubic stone. This this woman called Shirley, who was who was then doing her PhD on the UFOs, and she became an early kind of friend. She she introduced me to Kenneth Grant and let me Kenneth Grant books and images and oracles and Austin Austin Spare and that kind of thing. Um, and then in eighty one, I kind of finished my degree, moved back to Blackpool for a bit. Um, and I was browsing through some old copies of the Lamp of Thoth and I found a Blackpool kind of telephone number for this witch's coven. So I rang them up and sort of like got in, got initiated into a, a Wiccan coven and this was about, yeah, this is 81. Um, they decided I wasn't suitable material after mm. a, about a year and a half and they kind of like said, no, 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 you know, uh, you're far too weird and obsessive for us and we think you should not be in the occult. Um, which I didn't take very well and um, I went off to Isra Israel and worked in a kibbutz for about eight months and spent a few weeks touring Egypt sort of came back when the the war with Lebanon started in 82 um, and I was living in the Fens actually in, in a little village outside Lincolnshire but somewhere in the wilds of Lincolnshire and uh, I started having these a kind of recurring dream about Carly, and that's kind of what piqued my interest in Tantra. And uh, I spent a few years doing other things. I got into, um, I was in a ritual group in Nottingham for a while because I was working as a psyche nurse in Nottingham. Um, and I didn't actually get to Leeds until about 1986, something like that. I'd done another degree in the meantime. Uh, and I ended up in Leeds because I had some friends who were squatting in Leeds and that's when I st met people like Dave Lee and Ray Sherwin again um, and got involved with uh, the care scene there but also at the same time there was, there was a esoteric order of Dagon you know, oh, yeah, Cthulhu fanciers group that I yeah. got involved in and um, I met the guy who initiated me, initiated me into Tantra, who was also in Leeds. So kind of, Leeds was a kind of like a big melting pot for me. I got involved in the Chaos Magic scene and the Esoteric Order of Draylon scene and, and the kind of Amukos Tantric scene all simultaneously. Cool. So was there, I mean, was there a lot of that going on at the time? I mean, if you were hanging out with the Chaos Kids, um, would they also hang out with the Moonkos kids? And, and oh so yeah, there was, there were lots of crossovers. It, it all centred around Leeds University Occult Society, okay. which was very vibrant at the time. It was being run by a guy who was, uh, I think, in Ray Sherwin's group, Circle of Chaos. And it, it was it was interesting for me because I was unemployed at the time, so I had lots of time to, <laughs> to run around doing all kinds of weird stuff. That's when I started doing Pagan News as well and I, I kind of like really took off I, I guess wrong place wrong time well right place right yeah, time exactly. yeah. <laughs> cool um, so how do you get to uh, hanging around 
um, chaos magicians to going, actually, this stuff needs to be embookened? Um, well, I started writing for Chaos International. I mean, I'd, I'd been writing since the late 70s um, for various magazines. Um, uh, at that time, the kind of the cheap DTP um, thing had taken off, and there were loads and loads of magazines to write for, which was good for me. So I was writing for um, a variety of pagan magazines as well, as well as doing pagan news. I was also writing for Knox magazine, you know, Steve Senate's thing, uh, and Chaos International. And uh, there was a book, I can't actually remember the name of it, but it was, its subtitle was English Thelema. It was by this American guy, and it was, it was supposed to be about chaos magic. And I just thought, this thing's awful. You know, I could surely do better than this. Um, and I was I was involved in a in a small group of people which was kind of mainly Wiccan in orientation, but doing other kinds of magic as well. So we were doing bits of chaos magic and bits of other stuff. And I just wrote up some of the stuff I've been doing with that group. Um, added my own kind of like mythic stuff. Um, and produced these two little booklets, um, Condensed Chaos and uh, Chaos Served as a User Guide. Problem was, I didn't actually have the money to, produ to produce them, so it wasn't until I got to London that they actually got published, and, and that was in association with, with Ian Reid, who was running Chaos International at the time. I mean, I'd, I'd started writing a book in about 87, um, and worked on it throughout the 80s and sent it to a, a bunch of publishers and the response was a bit kind of like, well, actually this is very good, you know. Um, but I, I kind of kept working on that manuscript and throwing bits out and putting stuff in and, and that became the basis of Prime Chaos, which I think was first released by, again, by Chaos International in about 92. So did you go um, sort of Straight from Leeds down to London. Tell us about the pretty much, say. yeah. I mean, I I I ended up staying in a, in a Charlie Brewster's house, um, and Charlie Brewster was a member of the IOT and was running an IOT temple in his basement. So it was kind of inevitable that I would get involved with the IOT because pretty much everybody I knew in London was, um, and it was through the IOT that I got the um, contract with New Falcon and subsequently produced you know, the book length version of Condensed Chaos, which I wrote in about four months, mm -hmm. and it probably shows. Um, and then I did the revised version of, of Prime Chaos later. Right. So, um, bringing you back to, because uh, the, the, the thing you mentioned about the um, Kali dream, uh, I, I think is quite interesting. Mm. Did you have, have you had similar instances of that kind of thing throughout your entire life? Did you have any of those kind of um, fairly common, it turns out, param paranormal experiences as a child, any of that kind of thing? Um, Cause you said I, th I think I had all kinds of weird stuff happen to me when I was a kid, but I don't think that necessarily pushed me towards the occult. I think actually most people do have weird experiences when they're kids, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the recurring dreams about Carly were, I've, I had a, you know, I had all kinds of like, you know, you do occult stuff. You do. You read lots of books. You end up dreaming all kinds of shit. You know? Oh yeah. But the, the the Carly dream was interesting because I hadn't had much contact with Carly. I'd probably heard about her in Kenneth Grant books, you know. Um, but I'd never had any. I'd never felt any kind of like draw towards um, Indian stuff or tantric stuff. Uh, and but the dreams really put the hook in me and I think I was fortunate in that I was on my own in this village so I had nobody to talk to um, there was no internet of course in those days where you can you know you can go on chat forums and say oh I've had this dream about Carly what should I do you know I was thrown back on my own resources so I basically turned the dream into a pathwork and then tried to keep the dream cycle going um, and I was kind of like thinking well I'd like to know more about this. So all the stuff on Tantra I could find was all the kind of neo-tantric, you know, sacred sex stuff. And I thought, well, yeah, that's okay, as far as it goes. But I mean, I want the ritual, you know, I want the magic kind of side of it. And that took longer to, to find. 
because again in the 80s there wasn't that much in the way of, of written material available. I mean, there was, there was Arthur Avalon stuff, and yeah. that's pretty much and, it. And that would have been by then 70 years old? Yeah. yeah. But still, you know, I, I have them all on my shelves. Yeah. They're still worth reading. I've still got the Serpent Wisdom somewhere. I think it's, yeah. yeah, it's good. Uh, and it wasn't until I met this guy, Andrew, who was a member of the MOOCOS, and who, he actually did a talk at Leeds University Occult Society, and I just thought, wow, he's obviously the guy I need to talk to. I used to kind of stalk him. Mm-hmm. I found out what we where he lived. I mean, we got into a conversation, and I'd do things like um, across the road from where he lived, there was a kind of like little park area. So I'd go and like sit in the park area, just overlooking his house, and, and wait for him to come down the road and go in, and then give him a couple of minutes, and then just bang on the door. So, oh, you're in, you know, like I hadn't been waiting for him for two hours, and we'd we'd sit and have conversations, and it's, then maybe you know go out for a walk in Leeds in the in the around the parks in the night and things like that. Nice. Um, yeah, that's that blurry line between dedicated and stalking. I like it. Well, de- <laughs> dedicated and, and obsessive. You yeah. Know. Uh, I think that, that if you're involved, if you get involved in the occult, it's very easy to become obsessive about it. You, I, I don't know anyone who hasn't been at least temporarily. Yeah. I think it, it does that to you. Mm. So how is the. Um, uh, from the books to now um, uh, enfolding.org, which I adore. I think it's a fantastic site, and I love seeing well-researched and cited things uh, on the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, can you describe the, I don't want to say um, the moving away, but say the reprioritizing or deprioritizing of the Western esoteric tradition in favor of this um, very uh, research-heavy uh, uh, move to the East? Um, it's like I say, I, I was, I kind of got in, in, into the care scene and into the, the, my tantra interest flowered more or less simultaneously, but I, uh, because I was kind of moving in a, if you like, in a friendship circle that was predominantly chaos oriented, I, I kind of stuck with that. And then when I moved out of that, um, circle of acquaintances, um, I decided I wanted to prioritize my interest in tantra. Um, and what's struck me at one point was I was I was reading something about Kashmiri Shaivism and I thought, you know, I don't know where Kashmir is. I've been kind of treating if you like these these esoteric strata as as kind of like just like an adjunct to my existing Western oriented practice and not actually looking at the wider historical or, or social or political context. Um I've been I was kind of I realised I've been mostly coming yeah seeing it as a kind of exoticization of my existing practice and not really trying to understand it within its own terms and I think that was a big shift for me because I then started to um, try and understand Tantra in terms of its historical and, and social context and that kind of like pushed me more towards getting more serious about um Research, if you like. Mm. There was a, a post uh, sometime last year where you were talking about, I think it was about um, Ledbetter being a pedo and, and mm-hmm. describing the um, the Sydney theosophical uh, scene, which was interesting to me because I used to shop growing up at the Adia bookstore and I'd been to events in the um, theosophical library, in, which is, was just around the corner in mm. um, just by Queen Victoria building. And... Um, that experience you had about being the only person for sort of 30 years between the rest of them at the Theosophical Society turned me off something that I thought was uh, quite resonant as well. It was uh, old people talking about things that happened a long time ago. Mm. And um, do you... So was there a point when you said, well, I'm, the, the Tantra thing resonates with me more mm. and I don't know where Kashmir is. So was there like, a, okay, I need to get... Uh, I need to be quite diligent about the wider context and and go after that and and how did you go about it did you wander into a library and go right um history of the subcontinent starting with harappa or um kind of i mean, I, I think it's a, a general issue with occultism anyway is you read a lot of occult stuff and it 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 seems to be almost like it's framed in a vacuum 
You know, it, it's 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 completely removed from what's what's happening in the wider culture at the time. I mean, you know, you could say this about a lot of Western writing about occultism. It, it separates it from its its wider historical and social context, and that actually got me interested in. in I first kind of like started doing that in respect to Theosophy, because Christina Oakley Harrington at um, Treadwell's asked me if I'd do the lecture on Theosophy, and I was thinking, yeah, great, you know, time to put the hammer down on everything that's wrong with theosophy. So I started doing some research, um, looking at the wider context in which in which theosophy arose in the, in the 19th century, and, and actually ended up being quite, actually there's, as much as th there's a lot wrong with theosophical ideas, if, if you like, and to a degree, I mean, you can critique them on various levels, but actually, this is quite exciting stuff, you know. The um, I I've come back around to them in in, in a number of areas. There's the um, the inevitable ranking of, of of cultures that you get in mm. in high empire, which is unfortunate. But some of the other things that they found that uh, I, I I'm particularly interested in, in in some of their historical contentions that um, ancient Egyptian punt was in India, which it probably was. Mm -hmm. They had no evidence for that other than their um, sort of flim flam ideas, but it's mm. sort of turned out to be true. Uh, you have those kind of um, submerged cultures around Sri Lanka and whatever, which also exist, which was just, it just sounded like stuff that came out of this chain smoking Russian woman's head. Mm. Uh, and it did. But um, I, I, it fascinates me that there's um, some of the stuff they've, even, even a broken clock is right twice a day. So mm. um, there's, there's some pieces in it where you go, yes. A lot of it is flawed, I think, but it does warrant uh, extra analysis because it's quite an achievement for some mm. sort of uh, meddlesome middle-class English people to to put this stuff together. Well, you, what interested me <coughs> about the, the Theosophical Society is um, you get more than two occultists together and a bottle of wine, and they'll be very quickly by the end of the evening turned into the most powerful makers on the planet. <laughs> and you know, a lot of occult groups contemporary groups, I'm not going to name any names, but have this discourse within them, say, oh, we're the best magicians and we're the most effective and da 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 You look at the Theosoph Theosophical Society, they were the most effective magical group in terms of getting things done, you know, in terms of gr getting money in. You know, they had massive buildings everywhere. Um, more or less continuously running, which you can't More or less to... continuously running, massive sort of like um, ownership of, of printing press. I mean, the first, I think one of the first occultists to use radio was Ledbetter. I didn't know that. Um, and in, ter in terms of kind of like political clout, you know, they they have this weird relationship with India that you can see a lot of it as, as, as you know, colonial imposition, but there's, you know, there's, there's still streets in various parts of India named after various mm -hmm. theosophical luminaries. I mean, you've got any Besson, um, you know, playing a key role in the in the in the Indian independence movement, for example, um, and that is Colonel Alcott and Ledbetter doing doing work in Sri Lanka, you know, to mm. counter the, the to kind of the move towards Christianization. I, I do I find that very compelling. I also it didn't really occur to me until I read the piece coming back to the um, uh, the Australian Theosophist that it was briefly the Sydney Lodge was the biggest in the world, but mm. um, if people don't know Sydney, the Theosophical Library is. The, at um, Town Hall, it's in the it's in the middle of Sydney, yeah. uh, in you know beautiful sort of high Victorian streets and the rest of it. But also, my uncle lived in uh, a house that was run by uh, a, an old house for Australia, sort of eighteen nineties, um, big mansion uh, at the top of Glebe Point Road, and it was run by a mad pharmacist at the turn of the century called Magnus something. And um, he, everyone thought he was an alchemist, but he was basically cooking meth in his basement, and that's <laughs> how he got so rich. But he was also um, a member of the Theosophical Society because he was part of the Sydney Great and the Good. And that did interest me that um, Washington, D.C. has the Freemasons, mm. uh, as not as a, 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 a conspiracy to build things, but as a spiritual cultural influence. Mm. And Australia ends up with uh, the Theosophical Society, with Canberra, laid out as a mandala and, mm -hmm. and all this and I, that really that blew my well uh, yeah blew my mind but that was um let's see Thalima do that mm. <laughs> all right where are we on to next uh so 
There was no inciting incident um, other than basically a move and a realization that you resonate more with the tantra stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I like the classic. I like the. I love the um, a lot of Indian um, religious writing. It's you know, I, I've, I have a very devotional um, bent to the. You know that just plugs me straight into um it's the stuff is so i think that where i kind of start my approach to tantra is, is from a point of difference you know you got to let pe a lot of people say oh well you know all ritual is basically the same um tech is tech i think is is one of the phrases that particularly annoys me that and you know this is something that very much comes out in pete carroll's writings that all all ritual cultures are essentially the same kind of thing which kind of leads you to a position where actually all your rituals look the same um, and I decided to kind of like kick start myself again with my tantra by thinking that actually no it's all different you know the ritual ontology is different the the way people think about things we don't we take for granted like the the, the mind-body relationship or the how the imagination works or how ritual works is completely different and and it changes and it's pluralistic you know there's no one continuing line from say Pat and Charlie at the turn of the millennium to somebody like Abhinav Agutra in the 10th century you know there's mm. all kinds of upheavals and changes and, and different things happening you know but this comes back to that uh, exoticiz exoticization yeah uh, I my frustration knowing uh, as a personal passion and something I've sort of researched for 20 years is ancient Egypt and to take um, and this annoys me more than tech is tech but to take the attributes of a being so you pick Isis or Osiris mm. but you pick them in the 2nd century AD mm -hmm. by which point they're 5,000 years old yeah. <laughs> um, or at least Osiris is and you go well you've it's almost like um, getting a 35 millimeter film roll and just sort of stacking it up rather than running it through and, and the picture is muddy and um, India, I think, suffers from that as one, a, a living tradition mm. where from the outside you go, oh, that's what that's what those Indians do. And um, it, it varies in time so significantly and also varies um, culture by culture. So how did you, I mean, was there stuff extant that you could um, begin uh, practice with or did you go, right, no, I'm going to the classics mm. and I'm going to build this myself? Well, my guru... Um, introduced me to Sri Vidya which is the, the main kind of like practice stream I, I do at the moment um, that's interesting cause in itself because of course a lot of people don't like the idea of gurus um, there is a lot wrong with it that's true but it's also like you could say well there's a lot wrong with you know the whole institution of teaching it doesn't mean that we you know we can critique various levels of that but we can't actually throw the institution of teaching out of the window um, what it comes down for me is that I've actually always found it easier to learn from people than from books okay. you know and I think this is you know this is very apt for a lot of um, ritual magic and, rich, um, and magical activity you know, it's easier to sit down with somebody or to, you know, stand in a circle and have them take you through something on the spot than to try and figure it all out from some book. Now with Tantra in particular you're probably not going to be able to do that unless you have a good knowledge of Sanskrit and also the interpretive background to be able to interpret what the Sanskrit means in that particular context. My Sanskrit is not great I admit but I know a lot of people who are actually very very learned in not only in Sanskrit itself but also interpreting what a particular text means so I kind of drawn them as, as a resource and uh, speaking of resource would you say that uh, uh, academia has gotten better at Tantra I'm thinking of say David Gordon White um, or someone like that where there certainly wasn't um, that kind of information when I was looking at it um, in the 90s um, that's true I, th I think there's been a massive massive um, explosion of very good academic writing about Tantra uh, to the point where it's actually taking me all my time to keep up with it, <laughs> you know. I mean, we've gone from almost nothing, like you know, yeah, Arthur Avalon stuff, which is still worth reading, and and some other people, to you know, a huge amount of academic writing on the subject. Um, 
I mean, you mentioned David Gordon Why I think a lot of his ideas are interesting, but they're very highly speculative. They're not accepted by, you know, lots of his peers. For sure, for sure. And I think that the whole kind of like, the way we understand Tantra has changed enormously from it being seen as a kind of like, um, people's on the margins of, of, of Indian society doing things in little groups to actually seeing m getting a much more nuanced view of how tantric cults or groups or sects, whatever you want to call them, uh, interacted with the wider culture. Okay, so, well, I mean, that would, um, uh, I guess that would align with um, Wolcott's experience that he wasn't exactly hanging out with um, the fringes of Indian society. And then he... Who's that? Um, Arthur Avalon himself. Oh, yeah, Arthur Avalon, yeah. yeah. He wasn't hanging out with the fringes of uh, Indian society. He was quite up there. And so if he was... He's a very interesting guy. He seems to... I mean, he was friends with Annie Besson. He was friends with uh, Alexandra David Neal. Um, he knew some of the Tagore family. He, he seems to have kind of like interacted with the, the you know, the cream of, of the Anglo-Indian intelligentsia at the time. Very, very interesting guy. Uh, him and his wife tried to get into Tibet, but... Well, yeah. kind of turn back at the border. Um, there's a very good biography of them out, actually, which I think is is well worth reading. And uh, you know, he's he, he's he's interesting because he's one of those kind of like um, early twentieth century scholars who's actually seen as a as a friend to India rather than you know the majority of them were kind of like not very complimentary. Hmm. Let's say. And. I, I find uh, India's position in uh, Western academia fascinating because if you wind it back a hundred years from Arthur Avalon, mm. it was quite positive then as well. So it seems to, like um, the, if we look at um, the initial sort of uh, German analyses of uh, India and the antiquity of its culture, they got a lot of stuff wrong, mm. but they didn't... Um, they didn't assume there was uh, well this has to be Aryan because too many of these things line up and the rest of it so India's kind of gone in and out of uh, being uh, not respected but uh, its complexity has been uh, in and out of being acknowledged I think uh, the, there's definite phases I mean in a lot of the romantic orientalist stuff in the 18th century was very positive but very much looking at India's golden age sure. and, and then you get the, the idea of the degeneration thesis which ties in with the whole our innovation theory starting to get more and more popular in the 19th century and then you know the idea that we that we the British have to have to reform them yeah. you know re recover rescue them from their degeneracy kind of <laughs> thing um, and you know something I've been very interested in doing is, is kind of like looking at the um, how that discourse about India and particularly about Tantra evolves over the 19th century and how it kind of moves from being, well, Tantra is, is just the most noticeable um, aspect of, of Indian degeneracy and, and how that kind of shifts over time to being seen as something positive. Hmm. I'm still working on that. Yeah, uh, yeah I, don't, I don't think that's something you can fit in before, before supper. So would you do would you do it all over again the way the way it happened? Um, yeah, I guess so. Well, you know, I, you know, I'm, I spent seven years being involved in Wicca. Um, I did things that were uncategorizable. I did the whole chaos magic stint. Did pagan news for four or five years. You know, I'm I'm glad I did it all, um, and I'm kind of happy what I'm doing now. So does that? Uh, constitute. I mean, what what would you say to people beginning uh, now? I mean, I tend to say. I, it well, really I think I, I think it's a whole different ball game now. I mean, you know, the the internet has changed everything hugely. Um, possibly not always for the better. I'm I'm glad I kind of got my feet wet in occultism before the internet came along, and I had, you know, because I look I look at a lot of occult forums, and there are people asking questions, and oh, I don't do a ritual. What do you all think? Da 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 da. Just think, oh. I'm glad because in, in, in those days you either had people you could ring up if you were lucky or if you couldn't you had nobody to ask so you just got on with stuff you know, yeah. and, and made mistakes and you know, fell asleep during path workings and uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember there was, there was one time when I was, I was sitting doing a meditation at home and the, 
had my eyes shut, but the, the room started to get really bright, and I was kind of like, wow, I'm really good at this. And what happened, I'd, I'd actually made some homemade candles, and one of them exploded and started dripping candle wax all <laughs> over the place. And of course, the brightness was was a candle sort of like burning its way through the, I think I put it on a plastic holder. Nice. Um, I, yeah, I know what you mean. I get a, a couple of questions a day from people asking stuff that I don't reply to because go and do it and find out. It, it, mm. Yeah. Um, oh, it's really difficult sometimes because sometimes people ask you stuff which is so different from how you look at things I just think it's going to take several hours to explain why I but, and, and look, I don't have the time you know no for sure me neither but uh, also look where you end up like why um, look, look where you ended up so what is your um, how, how can you give a definitive answer to something like that like um, oh how do I make uh, oh I need to make the spirits um, appear visibly before mm. me how do I do that and you go that is, there are so many ways that I want to say that's a terrible question, mm. <laughs> but uh, you can't because. Um, well, you can. You, you no, can. But, yeah, no, no. I, I mean, giving someone an answer, as you say, from your perspective or how you see the world versus how they do. I mean, I, I see the world the way I do because I did stuff. Mm. Um, I built this, and yeah. I didn't. I didn't do it by asking people. So, no. yeah, I do. I, I see what you mean about the internet for sure. Mm. For sure. So, yeah, you know, it can be a good thing and a bad thing. But I think the internet has changed everything and it's allow allowed a lot more um, good information to come into visibility and also propagated a lot of, a lot of poor information. But, mm. you know, that's, that's the nature of the beast. Yeah, well, it is. I, I'm talking to Jake when I was um, doing this Find the Others with him. Uh, he said this, there was a lot of that before anyway. I mean, some of the, the wrong-headed historical stuff that... Um, and India is a good example of it that just kind of kept moving book to book to book through the 20th century because mm. people didn't bother checking if Mathers was right about stuff. Mm. Uh, so I, I, I think that's one of those kind of eternal challenges of, of the spirit. That's one of Pete's part. aphorisms. Um, he's, he did this whole thing called uh, the, the Apocrypha of Stoss, I think, in Kirsten International one time. And one of his aphorisms was, I'm sick of ideas that move from book to book without any intervening thought. And, you know, you could say that about a hell of a lot of things. I mean, you know, chaos magic as much as anything oh, else has, has propagated uh, all kinds of weird ideas without any kind of like constructive criticism going on. Or subsequent reanalysis. Um, I think this is a, a thing across um, the occult and that kind of world where we're still operating um, with a view of history and even science in some horrible cases that's from mm. the 20s at the at the latest yeah and you think hang on we've actually learned quite a bit since then so mm. look at that and then reevaluate our best guesses based on the kind of things we can be more confident of cosmologically I, I like what Jake said in his interview about reading about bibliographies yeah you know because <laughs> I, I do that I pick I'll, I'll I was um some friends of mine who do, who do a, a, some journal publishing were, were publishing this article about Tantra and they said, oh, do you want to read it? I said, no, I'll just show me the bibliography. And I was kind of like, yep, 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 that's fine. Yeah, that'll be a good article. Yeah. Um, I, that, yeah, okay, so... And, you know, you, you I, I pick up stuff and I say, oh, okay, yeah, they've quoted that and that and that and that. So basically they've looked at Tantra, but they haven't actually looked at any book that was published after 1930. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a bit weird, you know, or, or even 1950, but... But again, there's, there's, it's interesting, there seems to be this thing you get about you establish a comfort zone. Mm -hmm. and, and in Wicca, I found this, you know, one of the things that started to bug me about Wicca was I was, I was um, doing drama therapy training at one point. And I'd come back from a week of doing drama therapy and, and kind of like, ah, we should try some of this stuff, hey, it's great. And they'd be going, no, no, it's not part of the tradition. And I was kind of like, you know <laughs> what um, and then later on in, in some charismatic circles it was I encountered the same kind of idea and we came up with this idea that okay that unless you paint it back black and arrange it around a the sphere, they're not going to take any notice of it yeah you know and again it's this kind of like separation of occultism away from what's happening in wider society I mean I get a lot of my still get a lot of my best ideas from not reading occult books mm -hmm. Um, I, th I think I listened, it must have been uh, uh, an audio interview with you I saw on YouTube a few years ago mm -hmm. um, and it's 
true. Magic is actually kind of easy. Like, how many occult books do you need if you've got three how-to books? Then go and find real material about the stuff that resonates with you. Yeah. Um, would you say that constitutes? Uh, I'm sort of asking everyone this, but um, would you tell a young person to find the thing that resonates and uh, go deep on it? And go deep is look outside the occult. Definitely. Yeah. Get I mean, good at bibliography or Matsy. <laughs> you know, read outside your comfort zone. Um, when I'm doing research, I, I, if I'm following a particular premise, I'll, I'll kind of try and find every, anything that supports it. But I also find stuff that counters it as well. Yeah. Um, which I don't necessarily have to agree with either, but at least I've kind of got a, a wider picture than just going, oh yeah, you know, uh, this makes sense to me, so I'm going to write write about it from or do this from this point of view because it makes sense and it agrees with my my intuition or something like that i think it's all it's equally important to look at the stuff that that disagrees and and kind of evolve a critical perspective and i think again that's one thing that magic can suffer from is that um you get so caught up with what you're doing um which is good you know you get obsessive but you you start to kind of lack any any critical sense and that can be you can get to easily get to a point where you kind of like start to accept stuff uncritically which can be bad you know um, I had a friend who, who, who read the first Typhonian trilogy in a weekend and then read uh, The Unfortune's Psychic Self Defence and, and came to the not unreasonable conclusion because he was feeling a bit odd that he was under psychic attack, and he did this. He did this ritual that's in psychic self defence that summons the astral police, and which he thought would, you know, kick out the the psychic meanness. That didn't work. He sent his girlfriend round to me, and and she was like, he thinks he's being psychically attacked, and I'm going, well, I think he's probably smoked a smoked too much dope, b not eaten properly, c read too much Kenneth Grant far too quickly. Um, Tell him to breathe deeply and it's all go away, you know. That's impressive. If you stayed up all weekend reading, you're reading Kenneth Grant. I mean, <laughs> you, you know, you're gonna. I, I mean, I because I, I can empathise with that to a degree because that's what I did for years. I read all kinds of weird books, Kenneth Grant, etc., 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 and got a kind of like very confused mass of ideas rolling around my head, which actually it took me a long time to throw away and start to be critical of, you know, and just like hang on this. You know, this idea that I've got about the way the world works occultly is actually causing me more problems uh, than it's actually useful. So I'm going to just drop the idea. Yeah. You know, I, I did this a few years ago with the astral plane. I started to think of, think about the astral plane not as a as um as an ontological given, but as a kind of like an occult artifact and a, a cultural artifact as well. And I started thinking, well, actually, if I didn't have to worry about all this astral shit. I'd probably have a much kind of nicer time, you know. So I just dropped the whole idea of the astral plane. Nice. And now I don't have to worry about astral entities or astral energies <laughs> or all that kind of shit, you know. Yeah, cool. So do you think, last question, mm -hmm. is there another book at any stage ever after all this? You, you I, I don't know, you know. I mean, I'm just enjoying writing on my blog. I've mm. always written about whatever's been interesting me at any one time um, and not really much cared about whether anybody else finds it interesting I mean people do according to my Google Analytics program it's, that's always nice um, I, I've been having a kind of converse, internal conversation every couple of years about oh I should write a book on Tantra and I mm -hmm. think mm, actually maybe not you know so I don't know is the answer oh well I hope there is because yeah mm. it's a uh, um it's always a good day when I open up the feed reader and there's there's an unfolding article. That's, uh, mm. that's I'm i starting to wonder about that series on the on the Sandra Lahari, which at this at the pace I'm going will probably about take me ten years to finish. But <laughs> that would make a nice book, you know, that's commentary true. on the Sandra Lahari. Yeah. But as I say, it's it's a long haul. Mm. I was I was doing some writing um, on one of the verses this morning actually and I was thinking wow there's, there's all this stuff we can bring in about graphemes and phonemes and, and, and I just thought 
you know, this stuff is so complicated that I can't really, I can understand it, but I couldn't tell somebody else about it. And my yardstick on writing is, um, there's no point writing about something unless, you could, if, unless you've internalised it to a degree that you can actually explain it to someone else without tangling them all up in knots. So I can't just, I'm just going to leave that, you know. Which I think is kind of helpful because there's always one of the complexities of, of working with, if you like, alien magical systems is there's always, you know, you're never going to have a complete understanding of it. You're never going to be an expert in the same way that somebody who's, who's lived it for all their life is going to be. You know, it's always going to be partial, it's always going to be fragmentary. Um, there's always going to be things you don't understand. And reading a academic essay by David Gordon White might help you get there, but on the other hand, it might not. A lot of the time I feel that like I'm doing a jigsaw mm. where I don't actually know what the picture is I'm supposed to be making, but I kind of get a tremendous buzz when two two bits of it slide together, if only momentarily, and I go, wow, you know, that opens up this, uh, it's kind of like um epiphany almost. You know? mm. See, what I like about um, a blog post form is exactly that, where in, if you're putting uh, stuff together or trying to hold uh, certain ideas in your head, mm. they don't uh, coalesce for long enough for you to kind of park that to one side and then go and coalesce to others. But if you can put two together and put a post out, you can come back to it and plug it in. Yeah, and you and can come back to things later. And I kind of do that. I have these arcs of interest where I, I'll get really into a subject and think, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and if I'm lucky, something will call less out of it. And then I think, okay, well, I've got as far as I can with that. I'll maybe come back to it. And if it takes six months or five years or whatever, I'm kind of happy to do that. So I kind of quite like that idea of, of just being able to write about whatever's in my idea frame at the moment and then maybe come back to it later. Whereas I think if you're writing, a, or my experience with writing books is that you have to be a lot more focused. I have the same argument with, with friends who keep saying, oh, well, you should do a PhD. You could do a PhD at but but you could do a part-time PhD. And I kind of think, I don't know if I could hold my interests together. It takes up a lot of room in your head. You know, it, it, it's a very it. difficult process. And I, you know, I, I remember when I was first encountered people who were doing PhDs in the 80s and they were saying things like, oh, I, I don't watch television, I haven't read a novel. You know, I've just read on my subject for five years. And I was like, kind of like, Jesus, I don't want to do that, yeah. you know. If you ever get tempted to do a PhD, do a tantra book instead. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, an incredible I think amount that, of I think if I do do a tantra book, it probably will be very short. Cool. I mean, I, you know, I really, in, in many ways, I, I like Jan Fries book, Carly Cooler. Sure. Because that was a really good book from an occultist. And it kind of like made me think, okay, well, there's that. Okay, there's a lot I, you know, don't quite agree with it. But him putting that out has, has freed me from what I felt was an obligation to do all myself. Okay, that's a good question then. Um, for someone who is resonating in this sort of area, um, in a uh, in a tantra ish mm. um, world, but coming from a Western tradition, who should they read? Um, that's a very difficult question, actually, because there isn't one book. No, I know this is a big thing you get in in the cultism nowadays. But all you, all you need is this book, and you'll be fine. You know, and I don't, I don't think that ever works. It's like it's, you know. You, no, you can choose three. You could, I could choose three. Um, <laughs> no, it's still really difficult yeah. because Tantra is such a vast subject. I mean, I could say, okay, well, um, take Sri Vidya. That would be quite easy because there's not actually a lot written about it. But, the, you know, the two books there will be Douglas Brooks's books, um, Auspicious Wisdom, and what's the other one, The Secret of the Three Cities, and possibly a third would be a, a good translation of the Sandra Lahari. But that's only Sri Vidya, and Sri Vidya is but one, you know, tantric stream out of, you know, quite a lot. All right, then. And then you'd have to, you know, or, well, you don't have to, but it would be interesting to look at the history. Well, that, that was going to be, um, so let's cheat and go either um, uh, Jan Fries' book, mm. uh, some kind of very thick doorstop uh, history book, and like a British Library reader's card. So yeah, possibly, or, or, or um, you know, signing up to um, a good academic database. Hmm. I mean, I, I've, I've, I'm on about two or three of them at the moment. Yeah, it's the way to be. Mm. And, and uh, you know, I fully agree with what 
Jake said about research. You know, doing good research. If you want to take a historical, uh, culture-situated approach, then research is essential. It's not always easy to do, um, and it can be quite expensive. But uh, I think it's you know what Jake said about the the necessity of doing research was was excellent, and he's completely right. A lot of academic writing on the occult, whether it's you know Western historical occultism or India or Egypt or whatever, is you know pulling way way, way ahead of what get, actually gets into occult books. And if if we look at uh, the Golden Dawn and the Theosophical Society, that's effectively what they did anyway. Mm. They looked at the uh, the cutting edge of uh, academia and research of their day and said, "What can we do with this?" And I think it's time for us to do the same. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. And you know, the 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 Golden Dawn was was really cutting edge. It was. You know, I think a, a kind of pictures has emerged of the oh well they were all middle class fuddy duddies you know and I can't actually know they weren't you know well, I mean, most of their stuff happened when they were in their late 20s early 30s anyway yeah they, 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 were, they, they were kind, kind of, of they were kind of like the chaos kids of the time they you know were, and yeah. um you know they were great some of them were art school graduates and, and brought that kind of like you know flair for the drama into the into the order you know they were they were a really happening bunch and i don't, I'd actually think that kind of you know, there's a lot of focus on Crowley and Mathers, and they maybe the less interesting parts of it. You know, they are. Well, I mean, you have. Uh, I mean, Yates was briefly a terrorist. He was a senator. He's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, obviously a poet. Uh, so yeah, you do have, and they all got into this stuff at an age where it was very bright young things. It yeah. was um, twenty nine uh, to uh, early thirties, which uh, I mean. It's, it's, it's a good age for, for getting into weird shit and doing well, stuff. Well, and, and that sort of leaves us with two new ways, I think, of looking at them, which is, um, yes, they're less fuddy-duddy than they look in the kind of black and white daguerreotype images that you mm. have. But it also, I think, contextualizes uh, a lot of the information that people um, maybe hold in higher regard than they should because it was seriously a 29-year-old who wrote it. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. Uh, and, but... It, this well, I, 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 do, I look at things I wrote when I was in my, you know, late 20s and 30s and just say, you know. Yeah, it's part of the journey, but yeah. you, you can say, yes. Uh, and that, I, I think that analysis needs to be sort of looked at, at the mm. um, underlying text as well, but that is what is called research. Yeah. And, you know, I, I very near, when original Falcon wanted to re, um, reprint the two cows books, I was kind of like, do I really want them out there, you know? And... If it wasn't, if it hadn't been some, for some friends kind of saying, yes, actually, we think you should put them out there, because they're actually not bad, you know. No, of course not. Um, I wouldn't have done it, you know, because I, I kind of like got into a very weird relationship with a lot of my earlier writing and became very critical of it, uh, as much as I was critical of, you know, what I was coming from anyway. Um, and I, yeah, I think I, I kind of like read them occasionally now and think, eh, okay, well, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I wrote this. I'm glad I had it out there. But it's it's an object and a snapshot of, of a view of the world at the time. I know Pete yeah. has sort of gone well and truly past um, his earlier Chaos Magic stuff, and, and they're out there. I mean, if if Crowley, well, maybe not Crowley, he did like the sound of his own voice, but uh, if some of these... Oh, I think uh, we all like the sound of yeah, our voice. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But if, um, if someone lives long enough, eventually... Mm. Um, their ideas change or what's the point of being alive so yeah. um, I do think as a um, yeah I'm glad they're still out there otherwise people you wouldn't get any money and it'd just be the PDFs mm -hmm. oh I don't mind the PDFs no I mean, the, the PDFs have probably had a wider circulation than the printed well, it's, volumes it's and so been translated into more languages you know? which effectively <coughs> um, yeah it, it, it's moot whether someone wants to bring it out as a physical book but it does allow mm. for that for whatever remaining bookstores are out there it does allow for that that person mm. in Iowa or the Philippines or wherever to have that initial chance encounter that sets them on their way. Yeah, yeah, cool. I mean, I'm still, you know, I'm still very pleased with Pagan News. Mm. Um, that was a great experience, and I'm since I'm still uh, employed by my um, company to do magazine publishing. Um, you know, that, that's I think probably had the most effect on my life. That's interesting. Yeah, I can see what you're saying. That's really oh, yeah. cool. The magazines are, are bigger, they're in full colour, but they're possibly less interesting. Mm. But it still would have had a bigger effect in terms of continuity and the rest of it. 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's that's been the one continual stream. I started getting into um, self-publishing in the late eighties, and I'm you know I'm, I'm since I'm now still in the publishing world doing print and digital and online stuff. Then you know that's. I think it was my kind of like tortuous way of actually building a career out of my occult interests or something that emerged out of my occult interests has become my career. That's really weird because me too. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you very much. Okay. That, was, uh, that was lovely. All right. I'm going to switch this off.